Kia ora. Welcome to Women in Data Science Auckland 2020. This year, we're featuring a series of talks from women sharing their stories about their work and career contributions across many industries and academia. WITS Auckland is an independent event organised by the University of Auckland Faculty of Engineering to coincide with the annual Global Women in Data Science Conference. I'm Kate College, WITS Ambassador, and I'm delighted to be here to help share some of these inspiring talks. Today's speaker is Dr. Rere Moana Theodore. Moana is the co-director of the National Centre for Life Course Research and Senior Research Fellow at the University of Otago. Uh, ko Moana Theodore tōku ingoa, um, he uri a hau ngō Ngāpui. Um, kia ora everyone, um, my name is Moana Theodore um, and I'm a researcher at the University of Otago. Uh, and I'm also the co-director of the National Centre for Life Course Research, which is based um, at Otago University. Um, it's an absolute pleasure um, to be invited to give uh, this talk um, for Women in Data Science 2020. Um, and thank you um, to Kate College for inviting me uh, to give the talk. I actually attended this event last year in Wellington and I attended um, mostly um, to, to listen and learn more about data science. Um, and I have to admit um, that when I attended, I didn't actually know uh, what, what quite to expect um, because the term um, data science was relatively new to me. Uh, I'm an academic um, and I work at the, um, at the university as a researcher. So I was more used to hearing terms like statistics or statistician or biostatistician epidemiologist but the term data science was relatively new to me um, and so when I was asked to give this talk this year I actually didn't feel uh, qualified really to talk about uh, data science um, plus I get to in, in my job work with a number of incredible statisticians um, people like Dr. Jesse Kokoa. And so, um, but after talking to uh, Kate, um, she assured me that I would have something to offer. And so hopefully that's the case. And so in thinking about myself um, as a researcher, I thought, well, I would probably label myself as an, oh, I definitely label myself as an accidental scientist um, and a data user. And so I thought, well, maybe that's what I'll base my talk on, this idea of being an accidental scientist uh, and then a data user. So, um, and in part of that, as part of that second part of being a data user, uh, what I'll talk a little bit about is in my work, which is using longitudinal data um, and data from life course um, studies. And what um, longitudinal data is um, for those that are new to the area of data or data science is it comes from studies that follow the same group of people over time and collects data at different time points. And I also thought that I would um, talk about uh, my research as a Māori researcher as well, so as a Māori woman, um, and give a little bit of a Māori perspective as well. So I'm going to split the talk into two sections. I believe I've got about 20, 25 minutes. The first part um, being about being an accidental scientist, and the second part um, about being a data user. So in terms of being an accidental scientist, um, just to give you some context, it's probably helpful to know that I'm Generation X. So given that this audience is probably full of uh, numbers folks, it means that I'm uh, in my late 20s, early 50s, is how I like to explain that. Um, I'm also a Māori woman who was born and raised in South Auckland. So needless, probably needless to say, Becoming a scientist, um, for me in particular, uh, I would describe myself more of a social scientist, was not planned and it was not expected. There is no one, uh, including myself, ever expected me to be doing this type of work. Um, and so for people like me, um, when we think of, in terms of diversity in science, we know that uh, women are underrepresented in this area in science, uh, in data, and in terms of being Māori, we also know that Māori and also Pacifica 
make up less than um, 2% of our scientific workforce in New Zealand. Uh, as I mentioned, I work at university and currently Māori make up about 5% uh, of the academic workforce in New Zealand. And it actually gets worse the further you go up that pay scale. So that less than 4% of professors in New Zealand are Māori. And so um, in the last two years, I've actually been fortunate enough to work with some amazing uh, Māori and Pacific women academics, uh, people like Drs. Tara McAllister, uh, Sidiana Naipi, and um, Professor Joanna Kidman to examine some of those issues around diversity in our academic workforce. Um, and we've published a number of papers, including the paper, Why Is It My Professor Māori? Um, and we've examined the numbers of Māori and Pacifica in academia. And I'm going to come back to that collaborative piece of work um, that we're doing a little later, because I think that collaboration speaks to the power of data to shine a light on inequities and disparities. Um, and we also have some unpublished work uh, that's currently under review, where we've found that inequities in academia may particularly affect Māori and Pacific women. Yeah. So, um, and related to that, more and more so people talk about, or it seems to me more and more so, people talk about this idea of in, um, intersectionality. And so what does that term mean? Well, I, I Googled the definition, uh, and one definition says it's the interconnected nature of social categorizations, like ethnicity, like social class, like gender, and how they apply to either an individual or a group. Um, and so it's a kind of this overlapping or interdependent systems that of discrimination and disadvantage. Um, so that is how a person's identities might combine to create a unique, unique modes of discrimination or privilege. So I was born uh, in the mid 1970s and I started school in East Tamaki or Tara at a Deso One school. Uh, many of my whanau um, from, were from further up north uh, and had moved to places like South Auckland. In fact, mostly um, the majority of my whanau moved to South Auckland in what was described as the great Māori urban migration in the 60s and 70s. Māori were coming into the cities to look for employment uh, and to look for training. Um, and while I had some amazing role models growing up, uh, people like my nana, who was um, a founding member of the Māori Women's Welfare League, uh, and she actually helped to found the league branch in Ōtara, I didn't have any academic role models as such, and I certainly did not know anyone that was a scientist. Um, and so while I enjoyed maths and science in primary school and also intermediate school, I soon lost interest at high school and I actually stopped taking maths and sciences after fifth form or year 11 as they describe it these days. And I stuck with humanity type subjects and, and as a part of that slowly developed this belief that I was actually quite crap at maths and science. Um, and so on finishing school, very few of the kids that I went to school with went on to university. But my sister, who turned out, in fact, to be the scientist of our family, went on to university and she ended up doing a master's in forensic science. And so I sort of had, could see a pathway to going to university. Um, and she was able to help me sort of navigate, um, navigate within university. And so in my first few years, um, I did humanities subjects and psychology, and I took a, t I took a shine to psychology. Um, this was in the early to mid 1990s, and I began learning about feminist theory, post positivism, um, and to critique this idea that um, sciences were, uh, um, the idea of objective, objectivity um, in the sciences. And I, all of this, um, this thinking and learning was really um, helped or facilitated by some uh, amazing um, academics, people like Fiona Cram, um, who was teaching at the time, and Nicola Gavey. And Fiona um, also taught us about Māori psychology. 
And so I had thought that if I went on to postgraduate work, I would go on and use qualitative methods, uh, like many of the Māori researchers in my um, cohort. And of course, happening at the same time uh, was developments uh, in kaupapa Māori theory within education. And of course, by the late 1990s, Professor Linda Smith would go on to publish um, the landmark book, Decolonizing Methodologies, Research in Indigenous Peoples. But for me, uh, as opposed to moving down that qualitative um, pathway into research, fate intervened. And I ended up uh, down in Dunedin uh, with my boyfriend and now husband. And I got an interview, inevitably, I got an interviewer um, job at the world famous Dunedin Longitudinal Study. Now, I learned a number of things in that job, um, obviously, um, but in particular, one of the things that really stuck with me at the time was how um, research and science could have an impact on policy and practice and how science could provide evidence to help inform, to help improve um, health and well-being outcomes um, from birth, you know, um, over time. And so I got to see, you know, at that stage, um, this, this idea or this, this interface between science and evidence or policy and practice and how one might be able to, as a researcher, go about trying to change things with data or with, uh, with one's research. Um, and as a part of that, um, working on that study, I also learned about the power of data, having high quality data, um, power in the way that it could be used and also the power of having such data. Um, and the experience inevitably uh, led me to doing a PhD uh, and quant using quantitative methods in a different long-term um, study. Um, but although I was able to upskill in statistics and given my you know, high school experiences, I needed a lot of that, um, I, it didn't actually enable me at the time to focus more on Māori issues. Um, and then I went back to the Dunedin study uh, post-PhD and to do my first um, postdoc. And I was five months pregnant at the time. And so I am always eternally grateful um, to the study's director and who's now my um, National Centre for Life Course um, Research co-director, Professor Richie Polden, who offered me a position, despite me being fairly pregnant at the time, uh, with the second of my uh, third, second of my three children, um, and for being flexible over time in terms of my work as a mother of three. And I think it's really important for women uh, working in the sciences to have strong allies, people like Richie, um, given um, our underrepresentation. And so, um, and in terms of what I was doing um, during my uh, first postdoc, um, I would go on to learn more about longitudinal data modeling, trajectory analyses, and it would give me the ability um, to, to um, understand the use of data and to be able to work or interact with statisticians who were more qualified um, than me to analyze the data. Um, and so, as my wonderful colleague, um, Jesse Kokoa, uh, would say, it sort of brought out the inner statistician in me, um, which everyone apparently has, according, according to Jesse. So, so that's basically, I guess, the part of this talk uh, where I talk about being an accidental um, scientist um, that became someone that used data. And so I'm going to talk a little bit about that now. So... With my um, newfound statistical uh, skills and being one of the few within my, um, my own cohort of Māori researchers that was using quantitative methods, um, I found myself being approached more and more after uh, my postdocs um, to be part of research projects that would focus on Māori health and wellbeing um, and also wanting to undertake research to examine um, you know, inequities in health and social um, health and social outcomes for Māori uh, in Aotearoa. And so, um, but thankfully now we do have a growing number of Māori students and data scientists and statisticians that are coming through um, who will hopefully, we hope will inevitably lead the way. Um, well, our generation will just try and keep up. I, that, that is the true hope, right? And the true, and the, our dreams uh, in terms of being able to use data 
to, um, to address these inequities we see in our society today. In terms of Māori leaders in the area, um, I remember, I also remember hearing um, about Professor Paparangi Reid's work um, and her work uh, dying to be counted uh, in the very late 1990s that looked at issues and the way that the government was defined Māori in order to gather appropriate statistics um, to count Māori. Um, and also many of us researchers at the time and, and, and ongoing have referred and continue to refer to the um, haora, the Māori standards of health books um, from Te Ropu Rangaho Haora Eru Pōmari. Um, for those of you in, that are watching this who haven't read um, haven't read those uh, Hawara books, I highly recommend um, chapter one of Hawara four, which is focused on the early 2000s. It's a chapter on health inequities um, written by um, professors Paparangi Reid and Bridget Robson. In that um, chapter, they actually talk about um, our right as Māori to monitor the Crown and to evaluate Crown action and inaction. And interestingly, um, I saw probably a couple of months ago um, that Professor Paparangi Reid had done an interview um, with E Tangata. Um, and she said uh, in that interview, and I quote, one of the interesting things we did was to assume our right to monitor the Crown and document their action and inaction. So we spent a number of years, and sadly we're still doing it now, applying pressure to make sure that we were being counted properly and responding if, as happened in the last census, they don't measure Māori properly. She goes on to say, Statistics New Zealand failed Māori in 2018. It was entirely predictable. They didn't listen. We need great ethnicity data in all data sets. This should be a baseline commitment. It's treaty business, but they're so reluctant to commit to it. How can Māori plan our futures and analyse our past unless we have good data, at least as good as non-Māori have? For this to happen, for us to understand what our challenges and opportunities are and what we should do in the future, we need accurate, accurate census data. We must never stop checking on how the Crown is doing. So quite a long quote, but you can see why um, I was so keen to, to share um, that quote from Professor Reid. Um, so um, people like herself have continued to highlight for Māori uh, the ongoing long-term issues that face Māori in terms of the collection and the access to good data. And another book um, for those people watching that I would highly recommend is the book Indigenous Data Sovereignty Towards an Agenda. Um, that book was edited by professors uh, Tahu Kukatai and John Taylor. It was published in 2016 and it's available free online. Um, and of course, um, Dr. Donna Cormack uh, gave an excellent keynote uh, on Māori data sovereignty at last year's Wellington's Women in Data Science Conference as well. So as for me, um, as an accidental scientist and data user, I found myself increasingly being focused on Māori uh, longitudinal data, um, Māori life course research, and research that would um, ex research to examine long-term inequities in health outcomes for Māori compared to non-Māori. And so I'm going to um, sort of uh, now talk a little bit about uh, longitudinal data um, and life course um, research in New Zealand. So longitudinal data and life course findings from our New Zealand longitudinal studies like the Dunedin and the Christchurch studies, both of which started in the early to mid 70s, has been used to inform policy and practice in New Zealand. Um, and that includes research that has um, described and examined the importance of those um, of early life and early intervention. So when we think about, you know, the first thousand days of life um, through to debates, current debates on cannabis legalization. Um, so findings from these studies sort of inform discussion and debate in New Zealand. 
Um, and life course um, research findings and longitudinal data are increased, uh, you know, are used to help guide government policy, um, including things like, you know, for whom, when and how different types of prevention and intervention programs should be implemented. And so based on longitudinal findings, investment in prevention and intervention efforts um, has begun, has focused, increasingly focused on um, programs earlier in the life course, um, which are considered to be you know, possibly probably more effective, um, considered to be more effective than dealing with issues in middle or old age um, when things like ill health and disease um, can have an impact in terms of things like our medical services, in terms of our budgets and things like that. So, so this idea that longitudinal um, data and life course findings does um, have an impact uh, in terms of the way that we think about and inevitably fund uh, programs and services within our communities. And so uh, what we also know is that there's been limited Māori life course research and there's, there's, there's currently limited Māori longitudinal data in part due to a lack of Māori specific longitudinal studies that can focus on issues of importance to Māori. Now in New Zealand and worldwide, Māori and other Indigenous peoples experience wide and enduring ethnic inequalities, right, across a broad range of outcomes, education, uh, health, and throughout the life course. And so we know from life course epidemiology that the future burden of disease for Māori and for other Indigenous people will be considerable. And that what we need is ongoing programs to help prevent disabilities uh, and lengthen life in order to change this. And of course, my focus um, is more on Māori health. Um, so I'm talking a little bit more about that area. Um, to date, longitudinal studies have had relatively few Māori participants. Um, although there is the more recently established growing up in um, New Zealand study, which began in 2009. And it does have, um, that particular study, for example, does have the potential um, to provide, uh, you know, a number of longitudinal research findings for Māori. Beyond uh, what we have currently in terms of our longitudinal studies, um, there is the possibility, of course, and this is a, a data science audience, of using administrative data and data linkage to follow um, people longitudinally. And I think that's important when we think about uh, Māori research or Indigenous research, because obviously having those largest sample sizes enables um, researchers to have enough statistical power to undertake analyses that can focus on issues specific to Indigenous populations. So, so we have that, um, increasingly we have that ability, um, but in this era um, and we, of sort of big data, data integration, analytics, um, now more than ever, what we also need in order to be able to focus in on issues of importance to us as Māori, is we need Māori involvement and leadership in terms of the collection and analysis and management and governance of data. Because, and Linda Smith, I mentioned her uh, landmark book, um, Decolonizing Methodology, talks about this, um, you know, it, back, you know, and we've talked about this over time. Historically, what's happened to Indigenous people is they have been um, the research subjects, but not actually the research leaders. And so this resulted, um, and many people have talked about this over time, in a deficit, deficit um, approach or victim blame analyses. Um, where um, the focus of inequalities were sort of focused in on, on the individuals. And so also the other thing um, that resulted from that type of research has been as well worldwide, this exploitation of indigenous peoples and cultures, their knowledge and their resources. And so when we think about, and again, I mentioned, um, you know, people like Donna Cormack, um, who are working in this Indigenous data sovereignty space, um, thinking about um, our situation here in Aotearoa, New Zealand, we know that there's a wealth of data that's collected within the official statistics system by government, 
on Māori individuals, Māori whānau, iwi, um, tribes, um, but, but to date, that data has primarily been used for government purposes, um, as opposed to helping to support indigenous, de um, indigenous development agendas, indigenous aspirations, indigenous um, potential. And you can um, read more about that in that book I mentioned before on indigenous data sovereignty. And so we know that we need Māori leadership uh, in the collection and the analysis and the, and the management and governance of data. And for me, that focuses obviously on longitudinal data to help, to really help to inform health and social policies um, that can guide programs to support long-term positive outcomes for Māori. Um, the other thing we need is we need to increase training opportunities for an investment in our next generation of Māori researchers, our next generation of Māori data scientists, our next generation of Māori statisticians. So we can build um, this capacity and capability to lead future research and of course, iwi and other Māori groups, such as Te Mana Raronga, the Māori Data uh, Sovereignty Network, are constant, uh, focused in on this, um, these issues at the moment. Um, because as, um, as we know, and as we believe, data is a tonga, right? It's a treasure. And so it can be used um, by Māori and other Indigenous peoples to support this, the realisation um, of the rights of Indigenous peoples. Um, and high quality longitudinal data um, can also provide a basis from which we can monitor. And I talked about, you know, some of, the, um, some of those messages on Paparang, um, Professor Paparangi read, but we can monitor and evaluate and it can help us to identify um, th things that happen throughout life that can either create um, and maintain or to overcome inequalities. Um, and so longitudinal data, uh, data that's collected over time, can obviously support the ongoing monitoring um, as well and effectiveness of the policies and programs that we use in New Zealand um, to ensure that they are helping to support um, Māori outcomes and also reduce inequities. Um, the other thing that's important to think about in terms of a life course approach where we think about um, you know the life course from preconception all the way through to old age is it can actually be used to help as a framework to help inform planning you know and um, help inform planning and funding for Māori collectives. And so planning that can help Māori organisations, um, iwi to think about positive outcomes um, over time and also focus on strengthening, um, you know, whānau and communities uh, in, in terms of a long-term approach. And so uh, in a relatively, I guess, short um, space of time in terms of this talk, I guess that is why for me as a self-described um, accidental scientist and someone that uses data, why thinking about and why using uh, data is, is so important in terms of long-term outcomes for um, you know, our babies um, all the way through to our kaumatua. Uh, and that is what um, has made me passionate uh, in terms of thinking about and using uh, data here in New Zealand. And so I'm just going to finish by talking, I guess, um, expanding a little bit about, you know, once we've, once we've, ex once we've collected data, once we've ac or accessed data, once we've analysed data, what we, what we use it for and the change that we try and make uh, in using that data. And so data is knowledge and knowledge is power. And so data can speak to power and it can highlight things like um, inequalities, right? Power differentials. But we must also be mindful that even when we have data that shows these inequities, it doesn't necessarily mean that things will change. And, and, and so why is that? Well, for one thing, sharing power is difficult. Um, particularly for those that are used to having it. And recently, um, with broader global things that are happening globally, I, I've seen a meme a few times uh, on my social media, and it says, you know, when you're accustomed to privilege, equality feels like oppression. 
And so I'm going to finish um, this talk by talking, going back to that collaboration I mentioned earlier um, that I'm doing with um, people like Dr. Uh, Dr. Tara McAllister, where we've examined um, inequities and disparities for Māori and Pacific researchers and academics. Um, and so um, for decades, really, Māori and Pacific uh, researchers, uh, academics and scientists have talked about being underrepresented and talked about feeling isolated within our institutions and, and talked about dealing with racism as well within those institutions. And there's also been a lot of qualitative research to back this up. Um, but now we have access to better and better data. Not perfect, <laughs> not perfect data, but data nonetheless that supports um, what we were finding supports those earlier qualitative findings, highlighting um, that have highlighted not only um, that have highlighted not only inequities for women uh, within academia, within the sciences, but also for Māori and Pacific. And to create real change, once we have that information, once we have that data, is we actually need people in positions of power to accept that not only do these inequities exist, but to do something to resolve them. And sometimes as researchers working in this area, uh, we find ourselves sort of arguing uh, in terms of, uh, with people that can create change about sort of the minutia you know, maybe issues in and around how institutions may have collected their data uh, or differences in the way we could have analysed the data. And of course, those discussions are important. I'm sure I'm preaching to the converted when I say that uh, in this audience. Those are important conversations for us to have as, as people that use data uh, and as uh, researchers as well. Um, but how is 5% of our academic staff being Māori acceptable in today's society? And how is less than 2% of our academic staff being Pacifica and less than 1% of our professors being Pacifica acceptable? And more broadly, how is it acceptable that Māori women like me make up more than 60% of our New Zealand prison population? So why is it that myself, and I've told you a little bit about my personal story, would have had more of a chance possibly of being in prison, given my identity and background, them being a professor in my chosen field. And so as scientists and as data users, uh, people that use data or data scientists or statistician, accidental or not, um, as, as people that use data, we have a responsibility to not only highlight where we see inequities, right, but to also make changes um, to and where we can hold others to account. Uh, in terms of where we see those inequities. Um, otherwise, and I'm going to leave you with this quote, I'm reminded of the quote by Toni Morrison. Now, she talks about racism, but I'm going to leave this as a challenge, um, not only in relation to collecting, analysing and using data, but also acting on that data when it is presented. And what she says is, it's important, therefore, to know who the real enemy is and to know the function, the very serious function of racism, which is distraction. It keeps you from doing your work. It keeps you explaining over and over again your reason for being. Somebody says that you have no language, and so you spend 20 years proving that you do. Someone says your head is shaped, isn't shaped properly, so you have scientists working on the fact that it is. And someone says that you have no art, and so you dredge that up. None of that is necessary because there will always be one more thing. Nō reira, e ngā mana, e ngā, e ngā reo, e ngā rauranga tira mā, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou katoa.